Hello Watch Enthusiasts! Now today I'd like to begin a two-part odyssey into the history and the evolution of the dive watch. And the dive watch is most certainly the most popular type of men's watch on the market, in terms of having that recognisable bezel, the water resistance, and the rugged build. However, this has gone through a great deal of changes, from the early, very delicate watches of the 1920s and 30s, all the way through the start of scuba in the 50s, and of course the world of saturation and professional exploratory diving in the 70s and 80s, all the way through to the present day. And so in this video I'll focus very much on the technical side of diving, as opposed to the popular culture side of, of dive watches, such as their involvement with the James Bond franchise for instance, which I've spoken about before, but I think isn't particularly relevant to the evolution of this history. Of course, to keep this video a reasonable length, I've had to leave out a little bit of detail on each of the watches I speak about, and of course I have left out some watches altogether, because I've tried to include the most important and the most relevant to this story. But if you are interested in learning a bit more, then do take a look at some of my Story of an Icon videos, which go into far more detail about the individual watches. And of course, uh, the next video in this, in this uh, series, being a two-part series, will come out just a few days after this one. Now, the story of the dive watch begins in what must be said is rather an unconventional or unexpected place. And this is Rolex in 1926, when they released the Oyster. Now, the Oyster resembled a general uh, standard sort of, uh, sort of wristwatch at the time, with a knurled bezel, a smooth polished case, onion crown, and very narrow lugs. It also had small seconds, for example. But the beauty of this watch was the fact that it was the first hermetically sealed watch with a sealed case, and this meant it actually had, uh, had some method of preventing moisture and dust into the case. And so what this meant was that the watch was able to resist uh, water ingress relatively well, especially at, uh, at low depths. So it should be noted this watch wasn't actually tested to any sort of water pressure, but rather was tested to resist, uh, to resist moisture. And so very famously, this watch was worn uh, by Mercedes Gleitzer during an admittedly unsuccessful swim across the channel. And DG did succeed in, in swimming across the channel, but not during the attempt uh, during which she was wearing the Rolex. But this sparked Rolex um, into, into action as a maker of water-resistant watches, and certainly was the first recognisable attempt at making a watch which was able to, to resist this rather hostile element to the world of watchmaking. However, whilst this watch was certainly a water-resistant watch, where it was taken down to about 10 metres in the most extreme of cases, it certainly wasn't a dive watch. And I feel the distinction of the first dive watch has to go to a watch from 1932 from Omega. This 1932 release was the Omega Marine. And the Marine was very much from a period where square cases were popular, but also a lot of brands were experimenting with new technologies with regards to the moving parts on their cases. So for example, in 1931, one saw the release of the JLC Reverso, where here Omega, instead of having a, a flipping case like that of, uh, of the Reverso, had a case which was enclosed in a larger water-resistant one. The case itself was rectangular and contained the movement dial hands and of course the crown on the top. However, it was able to slot into an other section of the case which came down around it and created a tight seal around the bottom. And what this meant was that via a clip on the case back which was improved and, uh, and made more comfortable, the watch was able to resist water ingress at pressure. The system itself was in fact patented in 1931, but only hit the market in 1932 with this rather delicate looking watch, but still with a, a significantly chunkier form to a contemporary dress watch as a result of this additional pane of glass on the front and these en enlarged hooded lugs which fitted around the strap. And of course the curious thing with this watch is the fact that it, despite looking like a dress watch, was very much something that could resist very serious water pressure. And because it didn't use an external crown and, and was able to, to, to be protected merely by a single sort of uh, entry point around the bottom of that meeting point between the case and the, the watch itself, the watch was able to resist a depth. And so in 1936 it was sunk to, to 73 metres in Lake Geneva, which is impressive in its own right in terms of showing a very highly water resistant watch but also was then tested uh, by uh, the Swiss Laboratory for Horology in 1937 to 135 metres, which certainly proved the credentials for this watch as a, a genuine dive watch where the Rolex Oyster, thanks to having its, its crown exposed and earlier technology, was only able to resist water itself and not any sort of water pressure. In the mid-1930s, it's undeniable that the, the political situation in Europe was certainly in a troublesome position. As, uh, as international agreements were becoming more and more difficult as the League of Nations had less and less power and control um, as opposed to the ambitions of individual nations, and Germany continued to remilitarize, 
And so it's, it's unsurprising, really, that uh, the water-resistant watch became something that was conceived as a, a weapon, or at least as something to be used by, by nations at war. And so enter Panerai. And Panerai was a, an older, um, an older uh, watchmaker, indeed, from Florence. But through the 1930s, they produced a lot of watches with water-resistant cases, which were produced by Rolex with pocket watch movements, and so were sold via this dealer within Italy. And the first of the watches which have become famous from Panerai are indeed seen in the Radiomir line. And the Radiomir line was first conceived in 1936, and then actually released in full production in 1938. And the idea was to be a highly legible watch, thanks to a sandwich dial with a radium base, which is a highly radioactive um, style of paint, which is able to, to give off a, a blue glow at night, and so as a result is able to, uh, to be highly legible for divers. These watches were designed to be tools, and indeed to be used by people underwater. Now, this featured a fairly delicate case with wire lugs, as you can see, a, an, an exposed crown, and of course a dial which is, uh, which is uh, highly simplified in its style, but certainly did the job extremely well. And these were extremely large as well at 47mm, but then it's unsurprising, bearing in mind these were designed to be tools. These then did of course evolve with the, the use by these frogmen, by uh, the Italians, and in some cases the German forces. And so in terms of, uh, of the development, in 1940, the, the Navy required that the lugs be reinforced, and the hull watch be made a bit more stout, if you will, and more resilient due to it to be being used for long extended periods beneath the surface. And so one sees the Panerai Radium in 1940 evolve with larger, more built-up lugs. Now, as a result of being used by both the Italian Navy and the German Navy, they developed quite a lot of, uh, of changes in relation to the operations uh, performed, because these operations involved the, the use of, um, of, of explosives, which were carried um, either mechanically or manually by, uh, by, by divers, by frogmen, during that period, and then were clamped to the hulls of ships, most notably, uh, for example, in, in the port of Alexandria, where many ships were, were blown up, in fact, as a result of, of this tactic, which creates a great deal of fear amongst opponents, um, and certainly was a, a newfound way of attacking vessels. But through this came the use of plexiglass, for example, for crystals, which meant that they were shatter-resistant and were able to, uh, to, to resist the, the, the rigours, really, of use. Whilst also through the development of, uh, of new luminescent technologies, such as the 1949 release of tritium on these watches, in the, the luminal range, they were able to adjust uh, to be able to use less, uh, less harmful materials for luminescence when these watches used so much. Of course, in 1950, Panerai also used the famous uh, new luminor style of crown, with that surrounding crown guard with a lever, to protect the crown and also to give it uh, optimal water resistance, which was finally patented in 1956. Now, one very profound change to the world of diving created really the framework for the development of the modern dive watch. And this was the 1943 release of the, the Aqualung. And the Aqualung was effectively a tank of, of air, with uh, a regulator and two hoses connected to the, the mouth of the wearer. And what this enabled uh, was, uh, was more and more people to be able to enjoy diving and to be able to, uh, to, to access the sea and its, uh, it, its wonders with, uh, with of course, the, um, the protection of, of a very safe system. And very famously, this was invented by Emile Gagnon and Jacques Cousteau, the, the very famous uh, marine and, um, and uh, subaquatic explorer. Of course, whilst diving was very much in its infancy, it was a very, very, uh, very well documented fact that one had to ascend slowly. And so it was crucial for divers to be able to, to know exactly how long they'd spent on the bottom, and indeed to be able to time the various stages of their dive. And so it's unsurprising that in this period one sees the development of the dive watch as a, a unique concept that gave the diver exactly what they needed. Now, ten years after the invention of the Aqualung, it was again a military ambition that pushed the development of the dive watch in terms of being something of a tool for a military group that was planning to use this new technology. And this was produced by commission under Lieutenant Claude Riffaut from the French Navy and uh, Capitaine Robert Bob Maloubier of the, the French Secret Service, who was very famously extremely involved in the Second World War through airdrops into France. And so what they needed was a dive watch suitable for their purpose of having a French Navy scuba division with a rotating bezel and a highly legible design. And the brand that produced this watch was Blancpain, with the famous 50 Fathoms. Released in 1953, the 50 Fathoms became the stuff of legends in later years. The watch itself is very much the standard for what we would view a dive watch as, with its black bezel, its black dial, and its luminous indices, hands, and markings, making it extremely useful for a diver. Of course, it remained quite rudimentary with a non-screw-down crown, a bezel which rotated both directions, 
and of course a build which uh, which was not the most uh, the most robust in terms of its its uh, case design in general. But if one looks at it, one can certainly see the origins of what was to become really the gold standard for dive watches, and what what remains really that today. In terms of water resistance, it was less resistant than uh, than alternatives, for example, later on. But that's understandable, bearing in mind it was an early piece. Now, its water resistance was 50 fathoms, which is 300 feet, bearing in mind that one fathom is six foot, which equates to about 91.44 meters. As an early military dive watch, though, the 50 fathoms was certainly an accomplished one, with developments such as the mill spec version, where a marker was applied to the bottom half of the dial in a circle, which changed colour in relation to the amount of moisture in the case, and so as a result uh, allowed the, the owner, or the wearer, to be able to be aware if a seal was breached inside the watch, and water, or indeed simply moisture, had entered the watch in the movement. However, whilst many people feel that the Blomper 50 Fathoms should be declared as the sole winner of the competition for the first dive watch ever produced, I feel that one other watch should be noted in this period, which was the Zodiac Seawolf. This was released almost at the same time as the 50 Fathoms, and featured a stainless steel case and 100 meter water resistance in its early forms, which did rise to, uh, to 200 meters, which is 660 foot. But in addition to that, it was a dive watch which approached the problem very differently, with a fundamentally different dial design and those Dauphine hands which didn't catch on as well as those of the 50 Fathoms, but certainly should be regarded as another alternative for a 1953 dive watch, which, uh, which was just as important in terms of advancing wa watches and dive watches in that uh, direction. The third and perhaps most recognisable model of the early 1950s, though, is the Rolex Oyster Perpetual Submariner. And the Submariner was a watch which was released in 1954, but was extensively tested earlier on by, for example, the Institute of Submarine Research, which was in Cannes throughout 1953, in fact, where they conducted over 130 dives and up to 200 feet with this watch to test it at a variety of different temperatures to establish that it really was uh, an extremely competitive dive watch. And of course, these watches did have screw down crowns from early on because Rolex held the rights to it and also did have a great deal of practice at making water-resistant watches, bearing in mind they'd now been going for well over 20 years, which is, is impressive, bearing in mind the fact that Rolex were, were a brand which was relatively young by comparison to a lot of others. Of course, just by looking at the, the prices and the, the quality of the examples that are nowadays sold by the likes of, of Philips, Sotheby's and Christie's at their auctions, one really is able to, to see just what an impact this watch has had on the world of diving, and indeed on the collector community as a whole, with remarkable and really beautiful examples now available from these auction houses, for example, which are regularly seen, in fact. But in terms of the impact of these watches, they started off with the very famous 6200, in addition to the likes of the 6204 and the 6205. Now, the key difference between these models is that the 6200 was the large crown model with a 200 meter water resistance, with the, the famous caliber 296 automatic movement whilst the other two, the 6204 and 6205, were small crown submariners with a low water resistance, um, with water resistances seen of 100 metres and 180 metres during this period. Of course, with its blacked out dial and its extremely legible and easily differentiated hands, it's unsurprising that this watch became really the staple for what a dive watch should look like for years to come, and in my eyes is the most developed of these watches from the early 50s. However, it, it was also speculated that this watch was worn by Jacques Cousteau, the famous explorer, in his 1955 award-winning film The Silent World, which though appears rather barbaric by today's standards um, in terms of the, the behaviour of divers around the sea, Jacques Cousteau's work was, was extremely important in terms of, uh, of developing our understanding of diving, so it really was something of the period as opposed to something uh, particularly shocking. But it is remarkable to see that this watch actually was worn if one looks at some, some stills from the film by this, uh, this very famous uh, diver in 1955 when the film was, uh, was, was shot. Now, aside from the Submariner's achievements, Rolex achieved quite a great deal with the world of extreme deep-sea diving in the 1950s. And this began on the 30th of, no of, no of November 1953, when Auguste Picard, a Swiss scientist, descended to a depth of 3,150 metres with his son Jacques Picard in the famous Bathyscaphe Trieste. And the Trieste was composed of a, a spherical a ball at the bottom of the, the submersible in which the occupants would sit and could see out through a porthole. But that balloon above it was in fact used for buoyancy control to be able to control the descent of the of the, the, the submarine rather to the, the bottom of the sea. However, to the outside of the submarine was strapped a Rolex, and this was the very famous Rolex Deep Sea Special. And the Deep Sea Special was a completely custom watch with an extra thick case and an extremely large domed crystal, which when I say domed was a semi-sphere, 
across the top of the watch, creating an incredible resistance to the elements. And of course, it wasn't a wearable watch in the, in the general sense, but was fitted to an Oyster bracelet and was, uh, was very much a, a component of Rolex's history as far as being a highly professional dive watch. Of course, with regards to this watch's needs, it really did just need to be incredibly water resistant. There was no need for extremely high legibility or a, uh, a fancy bezel or any sort of additional functions. It simply had to be able to resist this pressure. And one does have to think that for the period, it's incredible they were able to make a watch that was able to survive um, the, the equivalent of, uh, of, of 31.5 bar, which is 31.5 atmospheres, or 3,150 metres. But however, their greatest achievement wouldn't come here, but would come in 1960, following a very famous and very important purchase. In 1958, the US Navy bought the Trieste, and they had the intention of developing their understanding of the deep sea, and did their understanding of submersibles as a general type. And so over the next couple of years, a great deal of developments and changes were made to the sub in terms of, of extending it a bit and, and making it prepared and ready to be able to take on really the greatest challenge any submersible had, had, had undertaken until this stage. And this was to descend to the, the greatest depth known in the ocean. And this was the famous Challenger Deep. Now, to put that into context, the depth they reached in 1960 when they eventually did descend in the, sub, in the submersible was 10,916 metres. The depth is even more astounding when put into, into feet, which is 35,814 feet, which is about the same height as a modern jetliner flies, and of course is also higher than Mount Everest is tall, um, which, is, which is an incredible uh, consideration, bearing in mind that this wasn't upwards, this was downwards. Now, it took several hours for the, the whole trip to, uh, to be undertaken, with uh, several quite frightening moments uh, with creaks and groans coming from the submersible itself, However, what's most incredible is, of course, the fact that another one of these Rolex Deep Sea Specials was attached to the outside of the submersible for this dive. Now, to put that into, into some sort of explanation, bearing in mind the usual dive rating of a dive watch of about 660 feet, these watches were put into, uh, into a situation where they had to be able to resist over a thousand atmospheres, which is an enormous amount of pressure for one of these watches to be able to withstand. And so on these versions, they had a, a larger and taller crystal, which was already incredibly tall on the original versions, to be able to cope with this extra pressure. Now, moving aside from the highly specific functions of those deep-sea Rolexes, a great deal of other watches from other brands started to emerge in the late 1950s and uh, all the way into the mid-1960s. And of course, one had a great deal of, uh, of models from, for example, Breitling and JLC, with super compressor cases and a number of interesting functions. However, the watch which I think shapes the world of dive watches the most, especially in this period in terms of its, um, its impact later on in the 70s as well, is the Omega Seamaster. And the original Seamaster 300 was released alongside the Railmaster and the, uh, the Speedmaster in 1957. And so this was quite late to the game compared to, to Rolex and Blancpain, for example, but I think held just as much of an important, uh, important specification, because of course of Omega's heritage. In terms of technology, the Seamaster 300 was very impressive, because it housed the very famous Omega Calibers uh, 550s and 560s, uh, looking at the, the date and no-date versions, which were extraordinarily reliable and notorious for being incredibly accurate. Likewise, the water resistance of these watches was uh, allegedly more than, than any other brand. Admittedly, this was, this was down to Omega's claims, because they claimed the reason why it was only rated at 200 metres was because they couldn't test it to the full 300, which they thought it was capable of. But in terms of issues it had early on, it didn't use a screw-down crown to start off with due to some legal reasons, um, and as a result used their very famous Nayad crown, which was a very clever idea, which meant that the crown was pushed in by water pressure, and worked in a similar way to super compressor cases. Of course, the only issue with this was that at, uh, at low depths, or shallow depths, at low pressure, the crown wasn't pushed in enough, and so was, um, was somewhat notorious for leaking in small amounts. This was admittedly rectified by Omega with uh, later versions, and indeed in service, these were retrofitted with screw-down crowns, which did fix the problem. But these were interesting watches because they were used very extensively through the 1950s and 60s professionally as the alternative to the Rolex Submariner. Because these watches were used, for example, during the famous Conshelf 2 dive um, and extended stay periods um, on the bottom of the sea in 1963, and also quite notably during the Comex uh, Janus 1, which went down to 150 metres in 1968. By this time, of course, the case had changed quite profoundly. Gone were the straight lugs, the broad arrow hands, and the exposed crown with that very delicate bezel, 
Instead, these were replaced by the very famous style of twisted lugs seen on, on, uh, on Omegas um, of old, and indeed that continue to today, which protect the crown due to an asymmetrical build, and also had a much thicker, much more legible bezel, which was more easy to grip, in addition to dropping the, uh, the broad arrow hands and the, the non-luminescent second hand, whereas instead they now had sword hands, which were much, much larger, more legible, and had loomed second hands, so that you, could, you were able to see them at night and be able to judge that your watch was still working. However, before I continue, one point which I'd like to make whilst I'm talking about the 60s was the 1961 establishment of the very famous company, the Compagnie Maritime d'Expertise, i.e. Comex. And Comex was an offshore diving contractor, which uh, was founded in order to be able to specialise in, uh, in work in extreme deep sea diving and engineering through the development of new techniques and new, um, new developments in the world of professional diving. And so, of course, they were involved to a great degree with, for example, the Omega Seamaster I've just spoken about, where that was used on a number of missions, such as, um, as the very famous Comex Janus 1, which went down to, uh, to 150 metres, and they used these Seamaster 300s during that dive. However, through the, the years, and indeed through the 70s when they became more and more active, the, com the impact of Comex on the industry was incredibly profound, and was able to, uh, to develop some of the most important and some of the most interesting pieces from the likes of Doxa, Omega, and indeed Rolex. Now, as a product of this newfound professional and industrial interest in the creation of, uh, of, of diving equipment, Doxa, a Swiss brand, created what can be seen as the first of the, um, the very extreme 70s diving watches, despite the fact that it came out in the late 1960s. And this was the, the Doxa Sub 300, and Doxa attempted to devise the Sub-300 as their answer to this professional market, and so started off with a very large stainless steel tonneau style of case, which protected the crown extremely well in its right flank, and had a brushed finish to be able to give it that, that matted, uh, matted appearance. However, the case really is, is irrelevant when one sees the dial and the bezel, which are the area which are most recognisable amongst these watches. Now, the dial was an interesting piece because it was the first of these orange dial dive watches, and it was selected because it was tested in the, the, the Neuchâtel Lake in Switzerland, and down to a depth of uh, about 20 to 30 metres, where orange fades and, uh, and becomes simply grey due to the fact that these wavelengths can't reach that depth underwater. It was the most legible and easiest to read amongst dial options. The hands were also key, as the minute hand was enlarged to be more legible, because this was the key hand one used to time the, with the bezel. And the hour hand was shrunken to be less of a distraction, and to not be mistaken for the minute hand in the dark, the loom was moved closer to the centre of the dial than the minute hand, so they were running around clearly different lines. This care was extended to the bezel, which featured around it inside these very useful timing, um, uh, timing markers every five minutes, with individual graduations for each minute. Whilst around the edge it had something completely new, which was the use of no decompression at times. And so this meant that at different uh, depths, you could still know how long you could stay there before you would have to do decompression um, on the way back up, which was interesting and, uh, and, and was a key new development to these watches, which made them, in my eyes, the first of these purpose-built dive watches, which, uh, which were purely designed for the task at hand. And it would appear that this was also agreed by a great deal of other people, because uh, due to the quality of the product, the US Divers Company, which was, uh, was controlled by Jacques Cousteau, started to market them for the US market exclusively, and uh, they were quickly a very large success. However, as a closing note to this video, between 1964 and 1965, at a depth of about 62 metres, um, as the maximum for both missions, divers in the, in the US Navy Sea Lab and Sea Lab 2 noticed a quirk with their Rolex uh, Submariner 5512s. As they decompressed, the crystals would pop off, causing quite, uh, quite violent explosions, as pressure was released from the inside of the watch. And so this clearly was a problem which needed to be addressed, and indeed will be addressed, in the second part of this history. And so do keep an eye out for the next few days for the second part to this video, which will carry on through the 70s, 80s, and through the achievements in diving all the way to the present day, with watches being the key, the key focus. And so if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and also to be able to enjoy more content here in future. So thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy. Out.